Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this new EADI virtual dialogue on COVID. My name is Basil, and I work at the EADI Secretariat in Bonn. We are the European Association for Development Research and Training Institutes, and we are a network of organizations working towards improving the visibility of development studies in Europe and outside as well. We have many more activities planned for the coming weeks, so if you are interested in what we do, I would encourage you to go on our website, eadi.org, and look at the series of events that is available there. Right, so today we are very glad to welcome Liliana Miranda from Peru, who will talk about community response during the pandemic. And the talk will be moderated by Talia Vela Aiden, who is working with us at EADI. Talia is a project officer here with us, and she also has a lot of experience in sustainable development in the Latin American context. In terms of format, we will now have about 20 to 25 minutes for the presentation by our speaker, followed by about half an hour Q&A that will be moderated by Talia. Okay, so I will now pass the, the floor to Talia. We'll introduce our speaker. Over to you, Talia. Okay, thank you very much, Basile. First of all, welcome everybody. Especially welcome to Liliana Miranda, our speaker of today from Peru. Liliana is a, an architect and the founder and executive director of the Foro Ciudades para la Vida in Peru, and she's currently working as an urban environmental expert and planner, and also pursuing a PhD at the University of Amsterdam on metropolitan water governance in Peru. She is also the coordinator of the Peru work of the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy and a former main advisor at the Environmental and Indigenous Communities Commission of, of the Congress of Peru. Liliana is the author of five books and 12 book chapters and has contributed to many peer reviewed journals. We are very honored and happy to have her today as a speaker uh, in spite of these difficult uh, times. So thank you very much, Liliana, and uh, you are most welcome to start your presentation. Thank you. Thanks to you, Talia, and thanks to Yadi for this invitation. And let me start sharing my presentation. I hope you can see it. I've been asked to make a presentation about the community responses to COVID uh, pandemic in Peru. And uh, actually being not of my expertise, uh, health issues or problems, it has, has been an interesting experience to prepare this as a person suffering on also as many others, this pandemic. So first of all, what is uh, who are we? we I, I am directing the Cities for Life Forum, which is a network of 35 institutions of 18 Peruvian cities. And uh, we are working 20 years generating alliances at the local level. We are co-producing knowledge. Most of those books are, and articles are have been written from the experience and, and expertise from all of these institutions, all of us together. We propose policies, laws, all eight of them have been approved, codes and municipal ordinance and plans, strategies, programs, investment profiles, pilot projects, etc. So going straight to the point, the situation about the cases in until October 15 from the WHO, it's that the Americas are having the most bigger quantity of peace, uh, people infected. So we are speaking about even twice, more than twice the number. Of course, North America is the, the one that is showing the biggest numbers, but Peru is also not that behind in comparison with the number of population. That's also very high numbers in South America. Peru has only 32 million people around, and we have a 1.1% uh, growth rate, which is going down. And our people, our population is relatively young, but 7.7 .7 people of each Peruvians live, each of each 10 Peruvians live in one of the 38 and more than 400 towns. Only in Lima, more around 3 million and a half were born outside Lima. So migrants uh, are already living in the cities. In totally in the whole country is about 5 million people already migrant that migrated to the cities. 
So the, the population, the urban population grew 9.5 times while the rural population grew by only 1.6 times between 30 years. 55% of, of the national population is located on the coastal desert trip and 30% of the population is living in Lima. So inequality is rapidly growing, extreme poverty has been reduced, but urban poverty did grow in the last decades. And there is a weak capacity of the marginal, marginal groups to stay out of poverty or leave it. So health services were critical and highly unequal before the pandemic. That's the context. Peru is one of the more vulnerable countries to climate change. We are suffering several risks and disasters. And our economic recession was starting before the pandemic too. And, but about 22.7% of Peruvians, more or less 6 million were poor officially. But several researchers were saying that this number was near 40%. So there was a whole, whole discussion about the multidimensional po poverty or the monetary poverty. Again, the urban zones were holding officially 4 million poor. So the vast majority of poor people are living in cities in Peru. But extreme poverty is, is still is living in the rural areas. The numbers in Peru are not well. You probably know this about the, the news from the news. So we are having near 1 million cases by 31st of October 2020. And the coronavirus related deaths officially reported by the health minister is 34,476. It, most of them concentrated, I mean, almost half of death are concentrated in the capital city, in Lima, as you see in the map. So we have 49 infections for 100,000 people reported the last seven days. Even the numbers are going down. But Sinadef, the place, the institutions where the uh, death people is registered formally, not the health minister, is saying that we have 80,000 death people, extra ones, in comparison with last year. So we are still far from herd immunity, immunity. But I mean, it's all, more than twice the number that the health minister is saying that are COVID deaths. This is the curve of the cases and the death people in Peru. We are having the, the wave down at the moment. We are having a relaxed time nowadays. But well, seeing the Europe situation, we think that you are our future <laughs> and we, we are going to be back. The point is also that if you see that red area in the country map, there are several areas in the Andeans that are not that uh, difficult numbers. They are light. And why? So we were analyzing this. And first of all, there are a lot of uh, programs, social uh, inclusion national programs. So they were together to grow pension 65, scholarship 18, which helped to reduce the poverty numbers at rural areas and even continue to do it for a long time. Quali Warma with the school breakfast, integral health system, doing a lot of support and trying to get the Millennium Development Goals. But during the pandemic, the subsidies and bonus established since lockdown in March together with food baskets delivered and support to communal kitchens were clearly insufficient. Learning at home working only for was working only for those better connected and equipped and anti-COVID health communities and other systems established were starting to work only in July when the whole crisis was already going on. The government also established a private company support program called Reactiva Peru, giving $20,000 million, four times the total budget of the total poorer people support. So several complaints started about inequality, the way that the government was handling the situation. 
and the subsidies also were not well focalized. The national statistics were confronted with the true difficult situation of the vast majority during lockdown. So many people did not get anything, and mainly rural communities, the poorer. Then we had an humanitarian crisis, the returnees, fear of hunger. The solution for them was to come back to their own communities. Some people say there were 500,000 people, others says it's 1 million. We don't know exactly the number yet, but more or less, there are 25 people of the Peru population related to peace and indigenous community. Considering those migrant I was mentioned, and then it goes to 50 persons. So the calculation were saying 15 million people were related to migrate, migration. And they are already an example of resistance with or without pandemic, because they are not getting that much support from social programs from the government or any other uh, means or, or institution. So they were preferring the risk of uh, COVID instead of the risk of dying of, of hunger. And it started to walk, walk back, thousands of kilometers. Native and peace and communities reorganized themselves and their productive capacity to hold their returnees, which came back without any support from the central government, nor bonus, nor social security. They were getting almost nothing. They were invisible in the social minister uh, database. They weren't exist. All of them in the ministry were surprised of the reaction of the people and the police and the government and the regional government and local governments were just like, what? <laughs> What's going on here? What should we do? And reacting on the way day by day, trying to support them. So the government is not giving back to them the resources previously extracted from those communities. There were not, not, not enough bonus, insufficient health services, very low prices of their agricultural products. So communities them, by themselves are providing the solutions to this humanitarian crisis. And Peru is learning again from those communities. This would be even a beautiful opportunity to generate a new way how the state can reorientate its resources for a more democratic way of expenditures. So the social and community organization, again, is the key. So, but those returning brought the risk of infection too. For avoiding such a risk, community organizations organized to keep the risk low with clear success in most cases in the Andes. Poor and vulnerable communities in rural areas in the coast, the Andes and indigenous communities in the Amazon have an autonomous economy they have their own food provision from their woods and agricultural lands. The only, the only risk was coming from their own relatives and friends that went back from, from the cities and to whom they have now to feed. So family and social organizations from native and peasants communities are demonstrating their capacity to survive and to manage conflicts over this crisis. So the primary problem, the problem to come is the food provision because too many people have come back and now the communities have to feed them and maybe the harvest will not be enough in the coming months. And the fear of the food crisis, it's also appearing and several, several experts are calling attention to this possible situation. But then, to avoid infection from them without the basic health services and education, they have faced severe, severe risk of infection, but handled in most cases. For instance, they were putting these uh, gates, yeah, saying the pandemic does not enter. They were having a strict control to enter to the communities and giving even getting support from the municipal serenazgo, which, which is a kind of municipal police and, and the police itself and the patrols from the communities. In the bus stops and cars willing to cross the community, people were registered, the identifications requested or not allowed to pass. The mask is obligatory in, all, in the whole country, still it is obligatory. So the health ministry supervision was there 
they were disinfecting the buses and others um, measures were taken. So, and the people who was meant to stay in the community, they were uh, forced to do the 14 days quarantines in hotels or hostels or even in school classrooms previously prepared for relatives and friends of community members. And the community was feeding them during those 14 days. So most of the children in those communities are not receiving classes. The virtual classes is, is an important problem is still pending. Education is pending for most of them. Tablets are being distributed by the government that the antennas are not functioning that well yet. And the tablets are starting to be distributed only this month. So they almost lost the whole year, school year. And the Ministry of Education is saying, OK, everybody is approved. That's it. No classes, and they are approved. But it's a problem still to be solved. Probably they are going to be in classes until next uh, February, not having any more vacations. But I mean, not having pres uh, presential classes also helped to do not get contagious. The hostels in neighborhood schools and use and host hotels for the infected and the vulnerable were established. And uh, they, the, those kind of hostels appeared all over the country and regional governments were helping, local governments were helping, and the communities were feeding the people and the health minister was also controlling the situation. So people arriving should quarantine in isolation in those places. And uh, communal centers were also used and nowadays are and again empty, but just for few people that go out, if they go out, when they come back, even they were living there, they have to go to quarantine again. Some problems of violence increased affecting elder women and children. So also municipalities were opening hostels just for women and children and elders, especially to protect it. So each place show a lesson of examples of organization, the patrols, the food donations, I mean, again, communities and social organizations are in charge of handling the humanitarian crisis from COVID without major support from the government. Solidarity is what identifies the peace and patrols, civic society organizations and community members, NGOs, and personal, personal the donations were established all over the country. And also private sector was contributing. Those living in the countryside in the Andes have sent their food products even to share with their relatives and friends in the cities and towns. So for instance, people from one community in, An in Ancash sent a, a truck full of food just to feed their families and relatives in Lima for a month, asking them to remain in the city before coming to the community so they could prepare to receive them. These kind of things were working through the organization, through the patrols, and with the help and coordination with local governments. So nowadays they are preparing and strengthening their agriculture to provide with food to their community members first. And, and this is something that is already a concern even to the government. Indigenous communities in the Amazon, they were having different strategies and the start of the strategy is not good for everybody. So native indigenous, urban and rural have been the ones who suffered the most without ambulance, nor medicines, or even less money to pay for mechanical ventilator or oxygen, they suffered quite difficult circumstances. For instance, the city of Iquitos, probably the only city in Peru which already got the so-called herd immunity at a very high cost. The peak was very pronounced, but now, they are not having almost any contagious nowadays. Pucallpa was another city and several villages, villages all over the jungle of Peru as well. So Peru is multicultural, multilingual country. So, and there is a need to carefully include the different cultural visions and habits before generating a rejection and fail. And in the Amazon, in the jungle and with native communities, we don't have that good examples. And also, we all, there is a need to know better the importance of the informal economy 
and the interaction between the rural and the urban extreme poverty and its regional particularities. I mean, what it has happened is that the urban and rural extreme poor have organized themselves to protect them, knowing that they will not get any support from the government. And those complex relationships between them uh, help them to better prepare to the crisis as, as COVID, but not it did not work that well for native communities. We need also to better understand the cultural dimension, language differences, and behaviors to develop more effective and quicker change of habits. Habits. Many of the information from the government was in Spanish, not in Quechua or Aymara, or even less in the native Amazon languages. So people in the Amazon, they get, they are much, they have, they have very much uh, more problems of connection. So they were not aware what was going on. So another thing is that we have an urban pandemic before which we have no chance without a vaccine or cure. And the problem is that we have been destroying biodiversity in natural areas inhabited by wild species, reducing them, reducing their habitat, came into contact those wild species with humans and pests of zoonotic animals origin and generating against are generating against which we have no defense. So more than 90% of the living people, of the infected people are living in urban areas worldwide. The impact of COVID is being more devastating in poor and densely populated urban areas, especially those living in informal settlements and slums. So what we are doing is to destroy in the, the habitat of the wild species. And then around 75% of all emerging infectious diseases are in humans are or zoonotic origin. So what we need to do is to protect the nature, to destroy it, expose and get us ill. And who are protecting more the nature? The indigenous communities, the peasant communities. So there is a tension between this urban rural divide, but also the natural one. And we have to find out the ways to develop strategies to protect the three of them. So this is pandemic is an opportunity to reinvent our relationship with nature and reveal a more friendly uh, with environment one, particularly from cities. Without a cure, nor effective treatment and having to wait for a trustable backing for another year or more, because for us, it's going to be very late. Probably in other places it will come earlier, but for us it will come later. And we have to find out the way to hold alive. So social organization, participation, governance reconfiguration are essential for building communities resilience. So in the case of urban social community strategies, we have to come back to social familiar organizations and, com so and communities organizations. They have to be at the center of the responses as they did in the Andeans and in even in the indigenous communities. We have to develop inclusive community plans together with vulnerable population, producing personalized message, providing access to services and commerce in a differentiated way. It's not one strategy that fits all. We have to build one strategy per place. Communities know better which are the options and they are better solutions. And risk perception differs between poorer and vulnerable groups, even inside the same family members. The youngsters, the teenagers, they don't think they have any risk. And the elder are much more uh, uh, in, in aware of what's going on. So we have to do different and develop different strategies for each member. We have to recover the social organizations for containment, such as a glass of milk, the soup kitchens, the common pots, the school breakfast, with the support of national government programs like Cali Warman, breakfast for the students at the schools. So I'm going to present now a variety of community and local government responses at city level, particularly in Lima. For instance, in the case of human settlements in Lima, at the east of Lima, 
what we have found is that we have moved from the sanitary crisis to the food crisis. So responses being implemented for this, it's to establish emergency models in communal centers, in whatever building which is communal in the settlement could be used, to provide safe water access for those without water connection, to support the communal kitchens or communal pots called ollas, the virtual connection between communal kitchens in Lima, to strengthening a kitchen network to promote their exchange and mutual support, and participate in a food security roundtable that already exists all along Lima. And then to mobilize the protest from the communal kitchens with flags, casserola, casseroles, and tweets, demanding the respect, the protection, and fulfillment of the right to food, the health protection kit, and community kit equipment. And this is starting to work. All communal kitchens that previously worked about 10, 15 years ago were more or less reducing their activity are now re-initiating their work and even bringing back the new, the youngsters, the new mothers to support the food in the community. So there are thousands of uh, lunches, at least a lunch, it's being provided by them. Uh, another proposal to eradicate, eradicate overcrowded houses is to the housing ministry. It's being asked to the housing ministry to, to increase the funding and provide subsidies for social housing. Of course, it's just one room and one toilet per overcrowded house to limit two persons per room occupancy rate. That's something that we are proposing also. And it is being built with the support with some NGOs in very few spaces and settlements. But if this is a proposal, a change in the policy, a social housing policy that is being demanded to the minister, by the Minister of Housing. And even better, to subsidize a refrigerator to avoid going shopping every day. And this refrigerator or freezer could be shared by several uh, families through the communal kitchens to be used to sleep also this, this room for, could be used for, for new business to increase their income options. In Lima, poor housing areas, there is one family per room and I mean, could be four, five persons per room. So we need to reduce this because in the, those spaces, of course, the infection goes faster. Also, these spaces could become kind of fever clinics and residential facilities could meet short-term isolation requirements. There are also a there is also a proposal of tambos, a kind of communal centers or uh, communal kitchens or uh, schools, uh, spaces where uh, it's possible to provide the access services as food, water, sanitation, electricity, and free Wi-Fi. Uh, acting as tambos, it is a Quechua name of communal places, to stop, to rest, to be fed, to, to even to work. To generate temporal hostels for infected people which do not need to go to hospitals and to prevent they infect their own families in the schools that are empty now. And generate co-working spaces and to study with uh, communal incubators of local services to maintain houses, computers, tailors, shoe repairs, or any distant service to increase the local employment. These kind of things are already happening in several settlements through the in initiative from the own organi communal organization. And of course, they strengthen delivery services in the neighborhood. Other responses from local governments in Lima is to improve and guarantee the biosecurity in markets, street vendors, supermarkets, and shops, establishing building entry checkpoints, providing a scanning and monitoring of occupants' health status and movements within the building. This is going a little bit far of the limit when yeah, the government is trying to close the beaches, for instance, for instance, because the summer is coming and they are not willing to allow people to go to the beach during weekends. And there is a whole tension and discussion on that. But they still, the, the local governments are trying to balance this and control and dis disinfect uh, as much as they can, or especially the roots of the food, from the trucks 
the fridge, and even to the motor taxis and the delivery to the house. This is working all over the country. Delivery is working and people is paying and buying through the cell phone and the laptop, finally. And of course, most of them are the middle classes and up. Not that much the poorer because they don't have a good cell phone or a good Wi-Fi connection, but it's increasing slowly. To strengthen the remote work, the services and shopping online, closing the digital device is something that the municipalities are also trying to get and to achieve providing the Wi-Fi connection for free in those tambos or communal centers. And then to expand the pedestrian lanes to provide the, the physical distance and massively increment cycle paths. This is a national policy now, something waited for a long time ago, but the transport ministry is supporting and provided the funding to the local governments to develop as much a cycle path as possible and promoting alternative means of mobility, including electromobility. And facilitate the change of business line, for instance, a business that was already having uh, working in, in an area that is not any, any longer viable because, viable because of the pandemic the municipalities are allowing the change of the business line very soon and quickly. Urban agriculture, for instance, in the Comas municipality of Lima, these are pictures from them, is also being strengthened by the municipality, supporting women organizations to warranty food, family agriculture, organic gardens, urban gardens. That's being done not, so, not only by Comas municipality, but, but almost every municipality in the poorer areas of the city. They are expanding and installing nurseries to distribute seeds, compost, and recovering the space of the streets and berms so people can plant whatever they want and can uh, uh, irrigate in near their houses and generate food all over the city. The spaces of avenues, lateral central berms is recovered to plant vegetables, shrubs, food with the neighbors different types of food and, and especially to be to, to feed the people and they are training them they are generating training courses and uh, sharing all the experience on how to do it better also there are markets solid waste management pedestrian and cyclopaths as protection measures for instance magdalena municipality started very soon on these measures and this is the municipality with the lower level of uh, coronavirus cases in Lima Center. And they are showing the results just by opening more space for the pedestrians, protecting the markets, providing uh, places to go wash hands and before entering to any market, collecting the garbage in the proper way with bios biosecurity mean ways and increasing the cycle paths. And they are having very much success on this. Other responses from local governments is to protect public spaces, the pedestrian parts, paths, parks, preparing them from their new usage, warranting the, the physical distance, recovering and widening green urban areas, promote treatment, recycling, and reuse of wastewater to irrigation and avoid using potable water for maintaining urban parks. And well, the results of all of this that is being done remain to be seen after the second wave to come. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Liliana. It was a very interesting presentation with a lot of food for thought for all of us uh, here uh, presently. So I would just pass to, to some of the questions that are appearing at the moment and the first one is uh, about what kind of institutional mechanisms exist to help communities feed their concerns and initiatives back into higher policy levels, or are there no such mechanisms? Well, there are uh, the, those flagship ships uh, programs I mentioned, but probably I should have included here the poverty roundtable poverty round table yeah the poverty round table is nationwide and this uh, poverty round table it's it's a concertation it's a concertation space 
where all the organizations, like I, as was mentioned, the indigenous communities, the peasant communities, the uh, patrols, the communal kitchens, the uh, glass of meat program, the health uh, anti-COVID uh, uh, committees, or all the organizations, they are allowed to be part of these uh, poverty concertation roundtables, which are uh, organized per, at national level, at regional level, at, at the city level or the provincial level, with the municipality, the regional government or the national. So through those spaces, they can interact with the uh, social inclusion ministry, the education ministry, the housing ministry, etc. Those are working. Actually, the, the person in charge or the chief of this uh, or in organization in the government uh, I know it's about to, to collapse because uh, of the immense uh, demands and, and meetings and activities they are holding right now. And uh, trying to be the connection between the communities themselves and the uh, government uh, programs so they can be more effective. Thank you, Liliana. The next question is uh, that uh, comes from Isa about, and it is about uh, the citizenship rights and the necessity to organize protection collectively. So what are the characteristics of the areas with high levels of infections? There are several areas of Lima with high levels, and why do they have particular characteristics or situations that increase such infection levels? Yeah. Well, as you see this, this uh, table here, I am going to... Uh, this is a statistic from Lima. San Juan de Lurigancho, it has the 35.4% of the infected people. And then it goes Lima, the center of Lima, 27%. The center of Lima and San Juan de Lurigancho, in the same order, are the poorer area of the whole Lima. So where you see the poverty, you see the more vulnerable to uh, being infected. Also, there is another district which is poor, very poor, El Agustino, but it is not in the list. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's something to be analyzed with care, but if you make a comparison between the vulnerable of infection, the vulnerability or the rate of infection with the the, the poverty in some cases are matching very well. In the case of uh, El Agustino, overcrowding houses are there all over, the same as, as in San Juan de Lurigancho and the same as in Lima. But El Agustino again is not in the list as the biggest cases, with the biggest cases. So it's something to, to be analyzed with care. Uh, thank you, this is a question from me. And, and it is about uh, the characteristics of the immigrant poor, either urban or rural. You said that there is a much need to uh, find out what are really the connections between these urban and rural poor. And my question goes, is, it, is there any research really going on on that in terms of uh, trying to categorize or to recognize what kind of livelihood strategies these various urban and rural poor are using. For instance, if you compare what is going on in uh, Kenya, where you can follow the patterns of temporary migration from town to the countryside every year. And with that, then you can organize as policies and programs. If there is something similar going on in Peru at the moment, Actually, this is something that uh, we, we have to analyze. I was saying that we need to better understand this. And I, I mark it in red. I was talking with the president of the concertation roundtable round to fight against poverty last uh, Friday because of this uh, speech also. And he was telling me that uh, they simply were um, like shocked of this uh, humanitarian crisis with all of these returnees and, and people moving back to their hometowns. And uh, 
they simply did not uh, in the government i mean they were not prepared to understand the kind of reaction that would happen and that happened in fact in the country so it was there was more or less one or month and a half of, of complete chaos and those who handled this and managed the situation very well were the peace and communities themselves on their own because the government uh, was following what the patrols were saying what the community organization was saying and they even the local government were the ones helping them with the health ministry etc and, and this is something that uh, it is acknowledged and recognized later on then the, the government reacted and now there are these uh, uh, health anti-covid committees and now there are the communal kitchen and uh, the kitchen pots but still the kitchen pots appeared from the communities themselves in the human settlements in lima and all over the the country in the cities so the way to feed themselves was solved by the people themselves because the bonus the subsidies were not enough at all and the database of the social inclusion ministry was a failure a total failure many people who was uh, dead received the bonus many people who were having were, were having enough uh, resources and salaries were receiving the bonus many people that were living outside the country were meant to receive the bonus <laughs> so it was a, a failure after another failure and and all the news and and the yeah memes in the yeah whatsapp were appearing making fun of the those kind of mistakes because this focalization program clearly failed i, I mean to to show to give the the, the true data of what of what was going on with the poverty levels in Peru. I, I, I was saying at the beginning that the official data was questioned several times by several uh, organizations, but several researchers. It was questioned. It was saying it is not true. It is more. And they are not there. They are here. They were alerting. They make, say, were making the alarm by the Pacific University researchers, which are very right-wing people. I mean, they were saying it is not correct. It was not listened. They were, uh, since 12, 2012, alerting on this, 2017, alerting on this, and then in 2020, it did not work. And poverty was much bigger than uh, officially recognized by the government. And then they were useless to help the people. We have a new question here, and it is about to which extent is this return migration semi-permanent? Do you think many returnees will remain in the rural communities once the pandemic is over? Actually, I think that, uh, well, this, this is just my personal opinion, because I know several people that have returned themselves. And, uh, and they, they were saying, I am coming back because I don't want to die of hunger here, but as soon as I can, I came back because all my staff is here and I want to recover my job. So they, they are expecting to get back their jobs. I mean, we have millions of people uh, unemployed right now. And th because they, they lost their jobs, they should go. But as soon as they can, they are expecting to come back because there, they are only surviving. They are only having a room to sleep and food, but they are not having another means of livelihoods. I mean, they don't have it. They are not having good education services. They are not having good health services or possibilities to get another uh, income. Thanks, Liliana. I don't know, Basile, how much are uh, we on time? Uh, otherwise, uh, there is still uh, one question. Yeah, uh, we can go for another question, Tali. Uh, okay, Liliana. Yes, uh, this is a question about the problems with the focalization of, of aid to the poor. And the problem is, as you mentioned, it was the surprise of the government. But on the other hand, once they recognized that the problem was there, it was still very difficult for them to change paradigm and stop doing this sort of bad focalization, as you already have mentioned it, 
and trying to look for other kinds of, of uh, better ways or efficient ways to make to the aid available to the people. Is it just also a kind of uh, a very much uh, situation in which the technocrats do not want to recognize the failure in this? Do, what do you think from your uh, own observations? Well, I don't think it was just a technocratic problem. It was a political option uh, to hide the levels of poverty and to show economic success and how much money we were having and how well we were going on. Well, the same as Chile. They were showing and visibilizing only the greatest part of the economic growth and you know welfare of the country, but hidden what was going on truly on the on the basis with the com common people. And uh, we were following their path. We were following clearly their model. And now Chile is changing the constitution. Um, and because it is not working. Also, we already had and are holding a kind of huge discussion of what to do with the pension system. The pension system and the AFP the private system of pensions that we were following the same example of, of Chile, it's being a uh, question and question because, I mean, nobody would get, the, I mean, the vast majority of the people would get a very, very low pension out of this private system. And also in the national one, the official governmental one, we are going to have a very, very short uh, amount. So the, the, the problem is going to come after the pandemic, probably in 10 years, because, because of the pandemic, they are allowing people to get out some money of their pension. Right now, just yesterday, they, in the Congress, they approved to, to people who have no uh, income the, to, to be able to retire uh, for UETS, which means about, about uh, 14,000 soles. Uh, $3,000, the second time in the, year, in the year. Even they already approve also the possibility to, to people to get out of the year uh, reserve for kind of uh, unemployment insurance, half of the money. Okay, everybody's managing and the economy is recovering and everybody's saying, okay, we're going, getting better as faster than all over. In the, in the continent, but in two, three years, four years time, those people who took the money out of their pension and their uh, unemployment insurance, they are going to be in poverty again because they don't have any protection. It's, it's coming, it's going to come. It's going to be very difficult times here in Peru, I think. Thank you very much, Liliana, for this very much uh, thoughtful presentation and also for your very good insights in the situation there and also your views of the future in this area. So I would also like to thank very much to all the participants and also for your questions uh, sent to me. And now I pass to Basile for the closing of the dialogue. Thank you, Salia, and thank you very much, Liliana, for this very nice seminar on Peru. If there are no more questions, we will wrap things up now. And I will encourage everyone uh, who hasn't done so to sign up to our newsletter so you can keep being updated about the different events we have. And just remind you that if you're interested, we have another seminar next week on the 11th of November by Professor Joita Gupta. Once again, many thanks, Liliana Miranda, for taking part in, in the seminar and agreeing to talk to us today. And we hope to see you all very soon. Good afternoon. Bye-bye. Thanks to all of you. Bye. Thanks to you and thanks very much for your presentation. <laughs>